Alex is hey, here. Hey. Hey, hey. Mighty's here. Mighty. Olivia's here. Yes. Hi, hi, Pastor Olivia. Okay, she's gonna join us. What? Oh. Oh. <laughs> Where is she? She's coming. Oh, Ashley's here. Hi, Ashley. Ashley, I spell. No. Oh, Ashley. Well, I didn't know hi, guys. Hey. Hi. How is everyone? We're good. How are you? I'm quarantined. You're really quiet. You have to yell. I'm quarantined. <laughs> that's your is only that attribute right? now. Yeah, that's who I am. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, Grayson and Julie. Caitlin and Ben. Yeah. They're all here. Madeline's here. We are eating at the same time. <laughs> that's awesome. Oh, oh, Ashley Way. Who's here? Suzanne. Hey, Poot. Poot. That's what she wants to say. Okay. <laughs> hey, guys. Welcome to 3D. Thanks for being here. Thanks. That was nice, Aubrey. Thank you for being here. <laughs> welcome. You're welcome. We just saw the Mills. They just came and visited us. They didn't want to be on 3D Live? I think they were going to watch. Yeah, I don't know. All right. Could have watched live, but... <laughs> they said that wouldn't be a very quiet studio audience. Yeah, well, that's fair. When are you well, off quarantine, Pastor Olivia? Tuesday. Tuesday. What, Tuesday. What's, what you're gonna do? I'm gonna go to Walmart to go grocery shopping, uh, and, to, and to Kung Fu Tea. Those are the. That's the that's, 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 that's your starting point. Like, I'm Walmart Kung Fu and tea. Kung Fu Tea. <laughs> yeah. For weeks, it's just been. Eating it's just water. <laughs> so much water. No, I've had really faithful friends bring me Starbucks. Oh, that's like right. multiple times, mm -hmm. which I thought was really kind. Is Starbucks, uh, is, are they still open? Are they considered essential or part of the food? Just well, the drive-thru. The drive-thru drive is essential. Uh, uh, of course. But not yeah. in any area. Yeah, no one has to go there. Um, hey, what? No. Max. Hey, Max. I bet he's saying hi back. I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure hey. he is. Oh, this is it. All right, well, we have some would you rather questions for today. Are you ready for this, Olivia? What's up? What's up? Yes. He did say hi back. And if you guys don't know him, this is Jared Link. Hi, guys. Hi, Jared. Hi, Jared. Hi, Jared. He's here to give us a good word today, but he's also going to be answering these. Okay, are you ready for the first one? I'm yeah. super ready. Okay. <laughs> this is, I have been waiting all day for this. Are you ready? Would you rather have no elbows or no knees? What? <laughs> no elbows or no knees. This is really important. I need to know. No elbows. I really have to think about this because... I think knees. You can't sit in a chair. I mean, you would be able to use chaise lounge. If you don't have elbows, you can't feed yourself or dress yourself. So would it be just like your arm, each arm is connected? Yeah, you would have to like have a dress. Nothing would bend. Like you would have to like do your, like a cup like this. You'd have to like aim <laughs> for your mouth. <laughs> yeah, I think I'd rather have no knees. I'm going to go with knees. Uh, no knees? Like, did you come up with this? No, no, no. Okay. What? Check your sources. <laughs> Sarah, you can't switch. You can't switch. You have no elbows. Sorry. I can't. I, <laughs> what would you say? You said no knees. Everybody else I said. said I said fine. no knees. I'll be fine. fine. I'm gonna need some people. I'm not committing to this for life. Okay. <laughs> next question. And you guys can answer down below in the comments. Yeah. You, you also can have no knees or no elbows. Would you rather really have no knees or no elbows? Okay. Oh, no. Next <laughs> question. Would you rather have the ability to read other people's minds or the ability to teleport to any location in the world? Teleport. That was fast. 100%. I don't want to know what people think about me. Are you kidding me? Yeah, that, would yeah, be that feels really, and it feels like I already am distracted a lot. And I feel like hearing everything everybody thinks would just. Can you turn this power on and off? Or is it no. constant? No, I'm going to teleport. Teleport. I would probably do teleport. Probably, I would. Thanks, Suzanne. Suzanne's with me. 
all yeah. the work instantly. Yeah. Everyone's yes. in We're all with you. Well, Suzanne specifically said it. She said, I'm with Olivia. So I just wanted I'm to say I wanted to say that. So <laughs> Jared, everybody sing teleport. <laughs> Nobody's with Jared. You can teleport on your own. No, he said teleport. Oh, I see what you're okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a humorous thing. Go ahead. All right, next one. <laughs> no, this is good. I like this. Would you rather age from the neck up or the neck down? Only? Age. Like age. You would only age from the neck up. My face is neck down. From here, from where I am now. So, or like, could I have started this ability <laughs> younger? Does this start when I'm a baby and so I have a baby face forever? Or does it kick in when I'm like no, 18? Right now. It's right now. My face is already looking old. I would rather age. I don't know. That'd be so weird if you have like an older face and then just like a youthful body. But then you can Aubrey, I don't like it. this question. My, would this make my. Your brain would age, though, if it was from the neck that, up. That's an important distinguishment there. Yeah. Oh, that's true. But you do want your brain to, I mean, you don't want it to break down, but you do want it to get. Alex says neck up. I just Alex want to neck know. up. Okay. Your brain would age first. So. Sheesh. I have no answer. I, I'm with I think I would rather, I want to say both. I'd rather age both. I'd say it, neck down. I'm not actually with her because of the quarantine, but you know. Oh, yeah. Who is she not with? <laughs> you can wear clothes. That's a good. That's a good thing. Yeah, that's a good idea. We also hope that you do. You don't. It is good. Not it's only good. could you, but this we recommend will it. Will make no sense on when we upload it to YouTube because there's no comments scrolling on YouTube. Oh, However, Aubrey was reading a comment she about said, how okay. you can cover up the old body with clothes. <laughs> Fine. Neck down. Down. I don't want to make an, a choice, but if I'm being able <laughs> to choose. All right. <laughs> All right, next. That's, that's the last one. Oh, I have three of them. Do you have anything to, to share with the kiddos? Oh my gosh, you, say, you said that last week, and it really threw me off, and I should have been right. expecting oh. it this week, but <laughs> I wasn't. Pastor I'm, Olivia. I have nothing prepared. Hey, Pastor Olivia. Yeah. Would you rather be <laughs> stunned by a bee? Or in quarantine for another week. Oh my gosh, stunned by 10 bees. <laughs> I would take 10 wasps. Sarah got stung bees. by wasps. Today. I got stung by a wasp on my elbow today. I'm sorry. Well, well I don't have to be in quarantine for a week, though. That's how it's played out. Yeah. Well, hey, Jared, thanks for being here. Or there, not here. Thanks for being right. there. <laughs> I'm still getting used to it, too. Yeah. And, you know. Thanks everyone else for being here. So that's all for me. It's gonna be awesome. Okay, we're gonna see you guys over. later. Uh -huh. See ya. All right, you guys are gonna move, so buckle in. <laughs> buckle in, everybody. How's that, Jared? Director. <laughs> Looks great. All right. It's all over to you, Jared. So what did you want me to do at this point? <laughs> <laughs> so as Pastor Olivia said, and Aubrey, my name is Jared Link. I've been on staff here serving at HSCN for uh, going on three plus years now. Um, I'm actually the campus minister of our future East Rock campus. Uh, we hope to launch in February of 2021, we're really excited to see what God's doing in the eastern part of the county uh, and the neighboring counties. Um, it's just an exciting time. Uh, it's a God is good and God is faithful. Um, it's good to be with you tonight. Uh, we're going to, I think this is a conclusion of the message series. So we're going to conclude the Culture Shock series tonight talking about identity. Um, and as soon as we hear that word, you almost want to attach gender to that, or you want to attach sexual to that? I mean, that, that is just the kind of the cultural narrative that we're living in now. Um, but there's so much more to identity than just those two areas. And so tonight, we're going to explore some of that. Um, to, to follow kind of Sarah's suit in, in order of the service, 
you would hear it say the world would have you believe that you are whoever you feel like you are, whoever you want to be. But I tell you, you are who God says you are. Um, so where do we go from here? Uh, one of the first things I want to just clarify is I am not a psychologist. I'm not a professional in identity studies. Um, I've lived with an identity for a few years, uh, but I'm not a professional. Uh, we're going to take a pastoral view of this topic, of uh, this conversation. Um, if this area in your life is difficult or you really struggle, there is no shame in seeking out professional counseling. None. Uh, there are people who would love to sit down and help with you. There are Christian counselors all around our community that specialize in this conversation. Um, you will know tonight if that's you, that if you really struggle with that, uh, reach out to your parents. If, you're, if you want to start with Pastor Libby or Pastor Aubrey, um, they would love to get you connected with resources in the community. Um, so this is a conversation. We're going to jump in and talk through, through some things. Uh, but certainly, if this is an area, there is no shame in getting professional help. So we're going to cover a little bit of ground tonight, so hang on. Uh, we're going to open in prayer. So would you bow your heads with me? Lord, tonight we thank you for this opportunity to gather uh, virtually. Lord, we thank you for technology. We pray that you would give us favor with technology tonight. Uh, Lord, as we discuss identity, Lord God, would you open our hearts to hear what you have to say, Lord, about who we are. And so... Uh, it's for you, Lord. Uh, we want to be like you, and we you know that you live within us tonight and even now. And so it's in your name we pray. Amen. So as we begin this conversation of identity, uh, I started out by saying it's so much more than what the cultural narrative is currently. Uh, I want to just talk first about where we primarily get some of our source of identity. Uh, I think very young we start by looking around. So we're born into a family. Uh, that has its distinct characteristics, its distinct culture, language, traditions. There's so many things that we're born into and that we kind of assume as our identity. Um, all of these distinctives serve as our framework very early on, and they're not in and of themselves bad. Uh, it's great that different cultures celebrate different holidays and different do things differently, different food. Uh, those things are part of our identity, and, and they're great. They're flavor. They add beauty and color to life. Um, as we begin to get older, our social circles expand, our world continues to get bigger and bigger with the element of social media, it's unlimited. Um, we gain many new friends. And so we begin somewhere along this process to start to notice that we are not just defined by uh, the family around us, but we start to wonder who else is around us, what do our friends do, what do our sports uh, friends do, what does our FFA club, uh, what characteristics or distinctives. Um, all these groups kind of have their own culture, their own distinctives, uh, if you will. And we begin to uh, wrestle with this feeling of wanting to fit in. Uh, I think it varies in severity for different people, but we are all born with this idea that we need to belong, we want to fit in. And so as our social circles expand, um, we start to sometimes take on attributes of other people that we don't even necessarily know that we like or agree with or we would have come up with on our own. Um, sometimes this means we even compromise. Uh, we sell ourselves out maybe just to blend in or belong to maintain our status or our aesthetic, as I'm learning is, is the cultural term today. This is often a betrayal of who we are in our innermost being. Um, and I know that can hit hard because I made some of those mistakes in trying to fit in. Um, I, I wasn't real solid on who I was when I was younger, so that, that specific thing for me was very real. Uh, taking on bits and pieces of different groups you hung out with, and that, leaves, that left me not really knowing who I was. I was just kind of a chameleon wherever I went. And I, would, I came, I'm going to date myself a little bit, but that was pre-social media. So it was a lot easier to do in those days because the world didn't connect in a social media platform for me. Um, but I get that, and that's not, a con that's not a thing of condemnation. It's just kind of an awareness of, wow, have I done this? Am I doing this? What am I getting for my identity from the people I hang out with? Um, and that, that issue, that problem, it is not necessarily even just related to your childhood or your developmental years. Adults wrestle with identity constantly, too. Uh, what we do is for a career, for jobs, that's a big part of who we are as adults. Um, and again, 
that can be great to be a doctor, a lawyer, a construction worker, a truck driver, anything you want to be. That's okay, and that is a part of who you are. But the problem begins to come when we define ourselves solely by what we do instead of what God says about us or who we are in Christ. Um, there, there really is, it, it kind of comes down to um, you, you lose a sense of self by priding yourself in what you do. Uh, we can kind of hide behind what we do. We can dive so deeply into working that we forget to just be. And Pastor Adrian spoke some of that this morning around the idea of Sabbath. Um, but it's, that's, I'm just proposing this as one area to really look around. Um, so two, two things that may, two potential problem areas with this idea of looking around and, and kind of blending in with wherever you go. First, it's not Christ-centered, not to overstate the obvious, but we should be looking to Christ, to what Jesus says about us for our identity. Secondly, this really becomes a problem when we lose the ability to do that thing we were identifying ourselves by. Um, whether that's a sports injury that takes you off the sports team, uh, whether your family has to move, whether you just get older and your responsibilities change, when we lose that thing we've been identifying ourselves by or that group of people, uh, it can be devastating. Uh, it strips away that part of our identity. And, and when you lose that piece, you can kind of go into this frantic search to fill that void. Um, and there are people in your church, there are leaders here that serve that are still years later trying to put some of those pieces back together from a crisis identity search that happened years ago. So there's a huge opportunity here to minimize future regrets if we can source our identity in Christ and a little less from who's around us and what's going on. And some of you may be wrestling with, it, with this even now, with this COVID-19 thing and all the schools being closed. Uh, you're, not, you're no longer playing sports. You're no longer in, at the band. You're no longer at the FFA meeting or whatever it is, or just running with your friends at school. Sometimes even that little bit of absence, you may be thinking, wow, who am I? Like, what am I supposed to be doing with myself and all this time? That's just a sign that we need to be sure of who we are and where we're putting our faith and trust and who we're drawing identity from in these days. And again, this, this happens to adults too. Uh, many adults right now are out of work, have been told to stay at home. And I even heard a politician the other day say that we need to get Americans back to work because it's a source of identity. And I just thought, wow, even our politicians recognize the importance in the society of what we do as it relates to who we are. Um, it, it just really came to the forefront when he was speaking and said, we got to get back to work so people can find, basically find their identity again. And I just, I offer, I plead with you, friends, that there is so much more to your identity than what you do or who you're running with. Um, and again, this, this is just an opportunity to look within, to open your heart to the Lord and say, Lord, search me. If you're in that season, if this is hitting home with you, Bring it to the Lord. Start seeking. Start asking questions about who you are in his sight and let him speak into that. So another place. So we look around. Uh, I think naturally that comes. We look around as we get older, it begins to change. So from looking around, I think a second place that we look for identity is that we begin to look within. We begin to look within. Somewhere along our journey, we realize that we're not only a collaboration of everyone around us, but we are our own person, uh, our own ideas, our own feelings. Uh, we begin to mesh those two worlds together, who we, who we see and who we are around other people and how we fit in our families with what our desires are, what our thoughts are. And again, your passions, what, what you find fun, your preferences, your joys, again, bring flavor and beauty and color into your life. And those are God-given things, but they need to be held, as far as this identity conversation is concerned, they need to be held appropriately and held in proper perspective as it relates to who we are. Um, the trouble when we look within is if we don't have Jesus, if we haven't experienced the heart cleansing that comes from Christ, when we look in, we are bound to see sin. We're bound to see a bent nature that we inherited from Adam. And so why is that significant? 
here's the truth tonight, friends. The truth is that sin will always prevent you from finding your true identity because it always, always separates you from God. So the truth is that sin always prevents you from finding your true identity because it separates you from God. The Apostle Paul described well the corrupt nature, this, this bend that I'm talking about tonight, and what that produces in our lives. And it's kind of an uncomfortable list, even to read it again now. We find this in Galatians 5, starting in verse 19. He says, the acts of the flesh are obvious. He says, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. Wow, that's a list that makes me just go, wow, yikes. And as uncomfortable as that makes us, I think we have to confess that apart from Jesus, apart from his work in our life, that's what we see. And it may play itself out in a million different ways, but I think that we have to confess that that is within us if we don't address that before God. So what happens? What's, what's wrong with that? What happens when we look within and we see a carnal nature of bent from sin? Well, we are living in a Western culture that has given us unlimited freedom and self-expression. Uh, almost to the point of like choice anxiety, you go to this cereal aisle and it used to be a quarter of an aisle at Walmart. Now it's an entire thing and it's this overwhelming sense of what do I want to do? What should I choose? It's all out there for me. And our culture has given us space for individual expression and individuality that exceeds the cereal aisle. There is virtually no limit and no barrier to your pursuit of what you think makes up you. And so... Our culture has told us that the lie that at the end of that pursuit is ultimate happiness. And that when we find our true self at the end of this search, that we will have found true happiness. And utopia will just erupt and it will be everywhere and it will be good. And friends, I think you can look around and you can look at what's happening in the world today. And even your own struggle with identity and know that that narrative might not have the depth that society would say it does. So we, I think, fall in a trap to where we can engage on this inner search of ourselves until the search itself becomes a prison. We can become so inwardly focused that we never realize the true meaning of life does not come from ourselves, but from God. And I think this prison holds many people captive and they don't even know it. Because we're searching within for something that can only come from above. It can only come from life and fulfillment in Jesus Christ. And so as we have looked within and we're on this pursuit and we're in a world that says the more far out you are, the farther you want to pursue it, we'll make room for that. And those, some of those issues are okay. I mean, that pursuit got us women voting rights at one point in our culture. So pushing those envelopes has gotten some positive things. But there are limits, there are barriers uh, that should be in place to keep us guided. So what happens when you have solely sourced your identity from looking around and looking within? I believe it can be hard to find our meaning for ourselves in this existence because those variables never stop changing. What happens around you never stops changing. Who in the world would have thought we would be stuck doing 3D Live over an Instagram feed several weeks ago. What's happening around who you get to spend your time around never stops changing. So when we are identifying by that, our identity is just this constant metamorphosis of change. We never are solid on who we are or what's happening. And the same thing happens within, because as our world changed, God gave us feelings, God gave us emotions. And as the world changes, our feelings and emotions change. As our stage of life changes, things inside of us change. And our identity can, on both fronts, just be in this turmoil, this mixing blend. And we're never quite sure. We don't have that bearing point of who we are. And so I think we can often be left bewildered. We can often be insecure and devalued because we can never really tell who we are. And if we do get a grasp of who we are, we're never really sure where it came from, whether it was just me or whether it's just a culmination of the narrative that we've been living in. 
now that we're all shouting happy and so encouraged, what's the alternative? What, what is, is there something different? The question remains, we will define ourselves by something. We will be involved in social circles. We will look within. What's the alternative? I would like to tell you a story. We're going to switch a little bit and, and turn to the Old Testament. We're going to go old school in the Old Testament today. Um, I want to look at the life of Daniel. Uh, Daniel starts, the, the beginning of Daniel's story starts at very young. They, scholars believe that he was somewhere between the age of 14 to 17, so many of you would fall within that age bracket. And that's the Daniel that we're talking about in our story here at the very beginning. One of the first places that I want to start is Daniel chapter 1. So uh, Jerusalem has been captured or has been besieged, so the enemy encamped around the town and cut off supplies until they had to surrender. So the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, and you may remember that story, uh, many of these stories from your childhood, because Nebuchadnezzar is also the king who threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the blazing furnace because they wouldn't bow down. So that's, if that name strikes a chord with you, that's where it comes from, which is also recorded in Daniel. So Nebuchadnezzar has taken uh, some of these young men. He has sent his officials out to find a couple good men. Uh, they were to be, uh, chapter 1, verse 4 says, young men without any physical defect, handsome. So they wanted to be, you know, sharp-dressed dudes, showing aptitude for every type of learning. So they needed to be smart, quick to learn, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. And the king wanted to put them in basically a three-year training program. So they've been taken from their home and put in, a, in an enemy territory, if you will. And that's hard for us to grasp at, in today's time because we don't grasp what it meant for an Israelite in that day to be taken from their land. Uh, they sensed a lot of their identity was from being in the land of Israel. So to be removed was devastating for them. So here are some teenagers who sharp-dressed dudes have a good aptitude for learning, seem like they got it going on. They're pulled out and they're sent in to learn. Listen what they're to learn. He was to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians. Doesn't that sound a bit like they were to have their identity changed? So the king goes on. They've, they've been given opportunity to learn. They're in the king's palace. They have all the, the king's provision. And part of that was meat. So again, if you go back to Old Testament law, the, the Israelites had dietary restrictions, dietary covenants uh, that they kept. And that was a big deal for them. And Daniel did not want to defile his relationship with God by eating from the king's table. It says in verse 8, but Daniel resolved not to defile himself with royal food or wine. That's significant because he has said, look, my relationship with God, how I interact with God on high is more important than what you're trying to do. I will not change who I am on the inside to meet your custom. So they basically asked to have a different menu. They asked to keep the meat that they, they not have be served meat, that they could just eat vegetables. And this was really a, a defiant act because they're saying, no, we don't want the king's provision because it might go against who we are on the inside. And that is so huge because here they are pulled away from it. their family, everything they've known. Who would have really known if they ordered or enjoyed an extra slab of bacon that week? Nobody would have known but them. But they were so true to their identity and who they were in God that they asked to just eat vegetables. And it worked out. They did a small test run, and 10 days later, they looked better than everybody else. There's another story that's really significant in Daniel's identity, and that's Daniel and the lion's den. You might remember the cartoon characters of Daniel sitting, petting pretty soft kitty lions, uh, but I believe the story went down a little bit differently. Um, so some leadership has changed. Nebuchadnezzar has been overthrown by the Medes. So Darius is king now, and he appoints 120 leaders. And lo and behold, Daniel, upright in character, is chosen again to be in this 120. Well, he made some enemies. Like, you know, he was always the guy with the right answer. He can interpret dreams. So people had it out for him. And they knew that they couldn't trick him. They couldn't trap him in some kind of scandalous affair to get rid of him. So they went to the king and basically said, look, we want you to punish, to throw into the lion's den, anyone that prays to a god besides you, king. 
well, that seems like a really re weird request, but the king's like, cool, sounds good to me. Might have had some uh, identity issues himself. But so the king makes this decree. Look, anybody that prays to any other god besides me is to be thrown in the lion's den. This is a pretty big deal because in chapter 6, verse 10, listen to what Daniel says. Listen to how resolved Daniel is and who he is. He says, now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Again, here's the, the significance of the land. He prayed towards the whole land, towards Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. He was not going to change who he was to fit the, the times, the, the cry of the moment. What is significant about this story, friends, it's hard to tell through here, but scholars believe that this took place 70 years, 7 zero, 70 years after he was taken into captivity. He didn't just make it seven days praying on his knees three times a day. He made it 70 years. He was that secure. He was that firm in his faith that 70 years later, when it meant his life, he went home and prayed three times a day. Friends, that's what an anchor can do for your life. That's not being identified by your circle of influence, by the cultural narrative that's going on. That's being identified and anchored in Jesus. And you can hear the king was heartbroken that he had to throw Daniel in the lion's den. But hey, he had done it. He had made his signet ring. It had to be done. So it says in verse 18, the king returned to his palace that night, spent the night without eating without entertainment being brought to him, and he could not sleep. He was distressed because he loved Daniel. Verse 19 says, At first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to rescue you? And we know the story. Daniel had been rescued. But look how the king identified Daniel. Just the night before, he had said, anybody that prays to anybody else is going into lion's den. And when he walks up to Daniel, he says, Daniel, servant of the living God. Friends, that's identity. That's getting it right. That's having an anchor for your life. So how do we get there? How do we get to that point of being anchored in Christ? What does that do for us? I, again, we're just going to take a walk through some of these ideas. It's a bigger topic than we can discover. But I think there's three things that we really start, that begin the process, if you will. The first thing that we get when we come to Christ is forgiveness. That's right, forgiveness. You say, how did this turn into a salvation message? Well, because truly when I said that we can never be our true selves, if we are bent to sin, if we are sinning, that's not just a throwaway line. That's pretty hard facts. Um, that matters uh, in that it will always separate. When we are living in sin or choosing to sin over what we know to be following Jesus, we are constantly under that weight of guilt because somewhere in ourselves we know better. So that guilt, that shame, that fear, that anxiety that we live with can carry an immense weight, and we cannot help but bend under its pressure. I propose to you tonight that that weight of sin will always keep a bend or a distort in your life under its crushing weight. And that crushing weight, friends, the good news is that weight is what Jesus bore on the cross for you and for me. He knew how significant it was, and he made a way that we could cast off that weight, that we could be uncompressed, if you will, from that burden of sin. Once we're out from under that weight, we can truly come into the form, the person that he created us to be. Secondly, I think when we come to Christ and in him, we find our value and worth as human beings created in his image. This frees us from ever really needing to ascribe our worth, our soul value, the inner part of who we are to any other person. Because let's face it, every other person's got their own mess. And so if we're finding worth and value or fulfillment from that person, we might be let down. We are pretty well going to be let down because they're people too. That, that adoration, that seeking of who we are was meant to go to Creator God. 1 John 3.1 says, See what great love 
the Father has lavished upon us so that we could be called his children. Have you ever thought about that fact that when we come to Christ, we are the children of God? The same God who made the entire universe and every living creature in it, the musician of the crashing waves on the seashore calls you son or daughter. That is an identity solved. That is an anchor point at which we can go forth. We can look properly on what happens around us, what's happening within us, because the God of the universe calls us beloved son or beloved daughter. Friends, that is paramount in our journey through identity, our journey through life. That is paramount. This gives us incredible worth and value to our humanity. If we were not cherished and loved beyond God, beyond measure by God, why would he have done this? Have you ever thought about the fact that we as minuscule human beings can say no to Creator God, that He loves us so much that when we are born, we have so much dignity and worth and value that we can shake our fist in His face and say, no, you will not rule over me, but yet He loves us enough to give that choice. Friends, that is a love that has a plan and a purpose and a desire to see you source in a different way, in a rock-solid way of Jesus. Friend, a God who loves us, that, loves us that much, who values us that much, who knows us before we're even born, as Scripture tells us. Friends, a God who loves us that much and made a way for us certainly has a plan and a purpose for our lives. That deep longing that we have to fit in is satisfied in Christ. That deep longing we have to do something that matters, hey, guess what? His kingdom is in effect right now and we can be his kingdom ambassadors. The Apostle Paul spoke in 2 Corinthians verse 5. He says, We are therefore now Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. So in Christ, we have a calling. We have a vocation. We have a job to do, and that we are to take his spirit everywhere we go. You may, If you've been around the church a while, you may have heard the phrase presence evangelism. Again, that's not just a cutesy hashtag that we make up. That is something we believe that as we go with Christ in us, he is on mission through us when we are obedient and we are sourced in him. So friends, not only have we gained our worth and our value from Jesus from a rock solid point, we have something to do. We have a mission that is bigger than us that is going on. We're getting ready to celebrate Easter in a couple weeks. That was the hinge pin of all of creation right there, and that from there forward, his kingdom is here and now. As we look through the world and all the craziness that's going on, friends, I've had to remind myself a lot of that here lately, and that God's kingdom, his story is still going on, and we have a part to play in it. Will you join me in playing a part in that? God's call for us to, is to be identified in him, to play a part in his kingdom, to be his ambassadors to a broken world who needs hope, who needs love, who needs to see that, to believe that it's true. Friends, finally, this is not a call to condemnation, okay? Um, if, you, if you've tuned out, just, just hit back with me here for just a second. Hear this one thing. It is possible to be in a saving relationship with Christ and still struggle to identify yourself as God identifies you. That's okay. Don't feel shame. Bring that confession to Jesus and let him speak into this area of your life. This is not a call to condemnation. This is an invitation to freedom. You can walk differently being found in Christ. Talk to your small group leaders. Talk to Pastor Olivia. Be honest. Seek truth. Listen intently. Read the Bible. Read what God's promises are, what he says about you, and believe it when you see it. Friends, God's narrative, his truth is the universal truth. What he says about you is the truth. So, friends, I encourage you today. Again, this is not if, if this has come across as condemning, I'm sorry. There is no condemnation in this message. It is an invitation to be identified, to have that set point in Jesus Christ. So bring it to him. See what God says about you and see the difference that that makes in your life instantly. It can be a journey, 
but you will know your heart has changed when you come to him. So I encourage you to, to stop, to pray. We, we've all been given a little bit more time in these days, a little bit more solitude. Seek him. Ask Jesus who you are to him and listen to what he says. Would you pray with me? Lord, as we um, tackle this topic, it seems impossible in 30 minutes, Lord God. You are calling us to be known by you. Father, what you say about us, beloved son, beloved daughter, of immense worth and value, Lord, that is true. Lord, we receive that today in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for your redeeming work on the cross that has paved the way for us to have a clean heart, to have a pure heart before you, so that we can let the nature of love come forth as who we are. Lord, thank you for your son, Jesus. Lord, thank you for your call. And so, Lord, as we open up, I just I invite questions, Lord. I, as people are seeking, Holy Spirit, come. Speak to our hearts tonight, Lord Jesus. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Let's give it up for Jared. Woo! I can hear the applause. <laughs> Roaring. Awesome. All right. We're going to open it up for a couple questions. If you guys have some questions for Jared. I also have a question. Oh, it's been on my mind. <laughs> clap, clap, clap. This is Alex. <laughs> awesome. All right. We'll take some of your questions if you guys have any. <laughs> you balance taking those like great people in your life that inspire you like how do you balance an inspiration and taking on someone else's identity That's where's good. that middle ground I mean I, I would think that the relationship to that person will tell because I would think we take on a lot more from our parents than maybe we do from an inspirational teacher but I think that line maybe would be uh, somewhat personal like are, what are we ascribing to them from them um I don't know. what do you think i don't know because it's because it can be all great things about a person but you, i think there's still a line that you you kind of cheat yourself because you're not taking on your own traits and you're kind of stealing other people's traits like even if they're good traits like you also have an identity that it was made just for you I think that's, I don't know, what do you think? Well, I don't remember if I, I know that I put this in to say it when I talked, but I don't remember if I actually said it or not, but um, I used to, when I started to, to put together messages, I used to think about the influential people that I looked up to who, who um, other pastors or speakers, and I would try to imitate them and, um, I think, oh, they've got this good style, and they tell, you know, I should tell jokes like them, or I should tell a story in, their, in the way they do. And one of them came to um, uh, our class and said, you know, God called you. He already, you know, he doesn't need you to use my style. He doesn't need you. To, he called you because he wants your voice. He already has me. He wants you, and he wants your voice. He created you with that voice in it. So you're not just, um, what did you say, cheating yourself, but yeah. you're... You're holding back from God what He gave you. Yeah. Yeah. There's a different difference, maybe, in mentor and Lord. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's, yeah. But I mean, I, I have benefited huge from mentors. I mean, that's, oh, yeah. I, I'm a contact, hands on learner, and mentors have been a huge part from when I was learning to do electrical work to even studying in ministry. I mean, I, yeah, it's, and, and to, Sarah, to your point, you, you kind of take on people's flavors, and I think. God gives us people in our lives to influence us, but if we try to replicate or duplicate, we're selling ourselves short as if we take it and learn and form our own. Yeah. But, yeah. Good question. Yeah. Um, Pastor Olivia asked, what would you say to someone who appears to be living a life identified by Christ but is really trying to live with multiple identities depending on who they're with? Oh, brother. 
Been there, done that. <laughs> um, minimize future regrets. I mean, that, not to take the cheap way out or the easy way out, but um, you are only one person. <laughs> You can only be one person. Uh, that, I mean, social media, I guess, has made it easier to be multiple people, maybe, with fake accounts or different circles of friends or whatever. Um, be you. It, it will only turn out poorly if you continue to be have multiple identities. And you, you might better say, look, dude, you're, you're 30 couple years old, married with a daughter. Like, what do you care about identity anymore? Um, you know what? I still have to be true to me. I still have to be true to who Christ says I am because things are changing. Like, I, I got married. Well, that was a shift, so now I'm husband. Uh, Eliza was born, so now I'm dad. Like, I, identity keeps changing, but we I'm still me. Like, I still am who God says I am. So if we're playing different things, I just don't think it's going to go well. I don't think we can base that position scripturally anywhere. I, I don't think. Speak in. Yeah, oh, the cat ain't got you going all night. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm soaking it in. I'm soaking it all the truth. I mean, you have because... to listen to me enough. Y'all go. I mean, you know, like, what did she say? Someone who appears to be living a life identified by Christ is really trying to live. And you might fool a lot of people, but you will never fool God. Yeah. And you will have, I mean, you talked earlier about, like, you just have that sense that knows if you are being true to who God created you to be and his plan and his purpose and and, um, and what he asks you to do to bring about that plan and purpose in his life. I mean, if you are uh, living a life of Christ, if you have been, um, I think, even guided well and mentored well, like, you should have a sense about it of what is... Um, what is right and wrong and what is good and God glorifying what is healthy and helpful. And, and I would say if, if, some, if you're out there and that's you tonight, there are people here that love you enough to know the real you. Um, yeah. Don't hide it. And I'm not saying you need to go clean up your mess before you come back. There are people that love you enough here and in your circle of friends that you can just be real. Don't hide it. Um, I think when, when I was coming through that, when I was struggling with that, the people who loved me regardless, who knew the real me that I didn't have to put on a front for, is who really spoke into my life. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, there's not a, I don't know that there's a great easy answer for that, but there are people here that love you enough to love you as you are. Mm -hmm. So be you. We'll walk with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, any other questions? I have another one. You guys don't have any ask some questions if you have any for Jared we still have a couple more minutes or ask question for Aubrey <laughs> and Sarah hey I'm still working I mean I'm still at the point in my life where I'm still working all that out but well t t my friends will talk about, about this now, though. <laughs> <laughs> check <laughs> so what does that look like so I mean we're we're in we're me and Sarah are close to stage of life yeah. but what what how does that relate I think for me, it was really hard when you go through middle school, high school, go through college, you really, you really are identified by what, what you can do. So it's like you are really good, you're really academic, or you're really athletic, or you're a really great musician or actor. And that's just part of the context of going through school is that you do a lot of things, like you have a lot of hobbies, but they become a lot of your, um, of who you are, of like who you see yourself as. And so I think it's just hard transitioning out of that and realizing what am I or who am I without any of those things. Like, what am I when I graduate from high school? What am I when I go to college and I'm a freshman with all these new people? Like, what, you know. Um, so for me, I'm just in that stage of transitioning out of that. Um, and I obviously can't, I don't know how people find their identity in things other than Christ. Or, like, find hope in things other than Christ. So, for me, it's been easier because I did grow up in the church. I did grow up as a believer with a relationship with Jesus. And so, I had a basis of where my identity was. But I think it's harder when you don't grow up with that. 
because I think every kid is inundated with, you know, play sports, play, like, do well on your SOL, like, every kid is told to do, is to, is their identity is in what they do. Um, so you'll get past that. You won't be, have to identify with that anymore in the future. But it is, it is weird. It's like a weird limbo stage. Um, but it's also very freeing, I would say. But I'm sure, like, you guys, there's different parts of struggling with your identity as you get older. And you, you, like, form an identity with somebody else. Or, like, you have to kind of... For me, um, you know, I don't feel so much like I'm trying to figure out... Uh, like who I am. Uh, for me, it's in the past no, a couple of years, it's been working out being okay with who I am. Being, you know, God, um, I, there, are, there are things about other people that I wish, you know, I had. There are things about other people that I'm glad I'm not like. Um, and um, there were a lot of years that, you know, you when you're trying to figure out who did God make me to be, or who am I, or what do I want to be, that you do imitate other people, or um, you just sort of test the waters. And um, it is just accepting. I think um, Pastor Adrian gave a, a sermon about gifts a couple, I don't know if this has been maybe two years ago, but he, he talked about... Um, I think one of his sisters had given him like a hot dog. Oh a yeah, dog, a hot dog a bun, bun or yeah. something like that. And he was like, "Thanks, guys." And so, like, there, there's parts of your. Um, and I remember that that being really impactful because it was I was looking at myself and how I was made and coming to sort of understand who I was. And there are parts of me that I was like, "Thanks, God, that's <laughs> great. I see that you did that. That." was what you said was a gift. And learning to appreciate who I am and um, and being okay if other people don't um, think that, if they just think I'm a hot dog bun warmer, you know? Yeah. <laughs> if that's all I amount to in, yeah. in their perspective. And I think that's the significance of finding your worth and value in Christ. Yeah. Is that it's okay if every person you meet is not it doesn't jive with you that well or they don't think your hot dog warmer is great. Like, it's, it's okay. <laughs> Uh, you, you're not look. You're not trying to pull value from every person you encounter. Yeah. And I think that's a significant part. I, I'm sure a professional could tell us more about it. But I, it's. I remember that process. But like I said, it, it's just different. We're in different stages of life. So. I off. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I was gonna say I like often will use it as like a positive default. So period out. Like if I fail or I did poorly at something. I'm but my identity is in Christ, so it doesn't. <laughs> That's and, a default. And like things, it's like, you know, things that don't, that I am hard on myself about. It's like, oh, I did that poorly. I didn't, I didn't confront that the way I'd like to confront it. I'd be like, nope, but my identity is in Christ. Does that reach deep for you? Or is that just like, where you're like, no, it's fine. Identity in no, Christ. No, it, it really does. Um, it does reach deep for me. Because it's like, it gives me an, an eternal perspective. Yeah. Which I lose a lot. I think that um, you touched on it when you were talking about how a lot of y'all are dealing with this, um, the activities and the and the groups that you have identified yourself as being really sort of shut down real fast, yeah, yeah. and it can feel unfair and um, upsetting. I know it feels unfair when you work towards um, being in a play. It feels unfair when you have worked for a senior season feels oh, unfair when you've worked for graduation and things like that. Um, and um, I know that as that's taken away, there is a sense of who am I without this? Who will I be without this? And um, you will be who, you will, who God created you to be. And I would encourage you in the time being not to, you know, sort of, burn down your house because you feel miserable, you know, because you're dealing, because you're working through it. Um, just, it's okay to say this is really frustrating and disappointing, but it's also okay just to 
work through it in healthy ways and to talk to people about it and to seek support because you're not alone in it. And I mean, we recognize, other people recognize that there is a lot about this that is just for this situation, for you personally, just feels very unfair. And we could just say it's unfair. We have one more question for Brianna. Uh, she says, what tips do you have to maintain your identity in Christ even when it becomes hard? I, I think developing spiritual disciplines. I mean, I, I hate to take, the, again, the old school answer, but I think, I think we undervalue spiritual disciplines in um, studying the Word, spending time in prayer, taking intentional time to stop, to pause, to push back uh, against the cry for more, as Pastor Adrian said this morning. Uh, it, it is hard, and it it is a long journey. It can be a long process. Um, I, I think sticking to those values of and disciplines of prayer, Scripture, worship. Uh, I mean, look at, even back to the story of Daniel, for 70 years he went home and prayed three times a day towards Jerusalem. I mean, he, he essentially didn't know if he would ever see home again. Um, but yet that, I mean, it says, go home and pray. Well, what does that look like? You have to find that for you. Um, we don't necessarily always need to go to a high mountaintop and pause and pray. I mean, you can pray driving down the road or in, in your bedroom or wherever you find yourself, but there, there comes a moment where a, a discipline becomes in play, where studying the scripture and prayer is a is a time of solitude where you can just hear what the Lord has to say. Um, when it's hard, I think it's, when times get hard, I think it's even easier to put those disciplines aside because you just want to reprieve, you just want to scroll for a little bit and just turn, turn off and and I know it's, in my life, it's when it gets hard, when it gets really busy, when it's difficult, those are the times that it's almost too easy to push those disciplines aside to just take a break. And truly, those times are when you need those disciplines the most. Um, I'm sure that's not the only answer. I mean, again, guys, speak up, speak in. Um, I'm all for the spiritual. I'd, I'd echo that. What when you? What did the king call Daniel when he came? Servant of the living God. Servant of the living God. And he called him back when he couldn't see him because he was calling out to him. Did you? And he was identified by his disciplines, by the way he practiced his faith, not by the fact that he was safe in the lions. He was identified by the way he, um, by his identity. Um, so definitely, I would definitely echo, read your Bible. I would encourage you to journal. I, I look back at journals that I had when I was your age, and it is um, fun and funny, and I can see the way that God answered prayers, and I can see the way that God just, you know, gave me the, the pat-pat. That's nice, Sarah, you know? <laughs> um, and then I can see, I mean, my faith development, and that's always been encouraging to me to have those look back on. And, and I think finding a friend that you can dialogue with through those times is, is crucial. Uh, putting it to But I don't think any of us are in denial. It, there is seasons it can be really, really hard. Uh, and it, it just stinks. I mean, I, it's just part of growing and maturing. Uh, but disciplines, a, a disciplined spiritual life of, of Scripture reading and prayer and uh, worship will not just get you through an identity search. It's a metric to get you through life, to grow in Christ. I mean, that's that's the same goal whether you're 18 or 80. Uh, the spiritual disciplines uh, are crucial for maintaining health, spiritual health, uh, and so much more. We're going to wrap things up. Thanks again for joining us tonight, guys. Um, this wraps up our Culture Shock series. Um, thanks again, Jared, for coming and speaking. Thanks for having me. such a good message. Um, and we're hoping to be back next week, so stay tuned. Uh, we're going to uh, mix things up uh, for next Sunday. 
Um, so just stay tuned for news on that. But thank you to Sarah as well for being here. <laughs>